Hello and welcome to today's talk about forensic analysis in uh, KNX log data. We want to have a look uh, in general about logging, what is logging for, what do you have to pay attention to, and uh, later on we'll have a look at some more specific KNX data, what you can log, um, what a look should consist of. Um, we'll have a look at um, yeah, a logging period of several months um, to have a short insight to get an impression what is sent around at the bus and in the later part we'll also have a practical session I will show you in the ETS software how to program a KNX network with a just a switching actuator and a light switch so just a light switch button and the lamp which will switch on. Um, so just let us start who am I? I'm Johannes Goltz. I'm working at the University of Rostock now for um, already two years. Um, my research interests, interests are about enhancing the security level of building automation systems. Um, I'm also looking at intrusion detection systems, anomaly detection and deep packet inspection in this um, yeah, special field of field buses which are used for building automation systems mostly. Yeah, just let us start with logging in general. Why is logging so important? I mean, all of you will know about logs. You can find log files everywhere on your computer, on server systems, and also in building automation systems, for example. And if they are enabled, but we'll come to that later. So why is logging important? We'll have a look at what are logs for? What are they used for? Um, how can we review them? So what is important if we look at them? Um, where should we collect such uh, files? And how we can analyze them to get the information we want. Let us now come to logging in general. So what are logs? What are they consisting of? Normally logs are generated by a system or software or devices which are attached to systems actually. And um, you can find them in very different areas. So for example, if you have a software where you have trouble with, where something is not working like it's intended to, um, you will often get the suggestions to enable logs so that you can send these log files to the producers or the programmers of the software. And they are, or these logs are helpful for the people um, who have written the software to find out where the trouble is situated, where the error is, what went wrong actually. So they can see out of the log files what you were doing and where the software had an error where something went wrong. So what is a log message consisting of? If we break it down, we have normally a timestamp in it. This is the timestamp when the log entry was registered, so when it was received at the system. Then we also need a source. There is um, normally an IP address or a host name in it. And we have some data. Um, there is normally a log message and a severity level, for example, low, medium, high, or something like debug, normal, error, something like that, so that you only log errors, for example, or if you enable the debug level, you will get a lot of entries in the log file so that you have a better view what happened in the software, which steps were performed um, to get just a more detailed view. If you enable only an error log, for example, you only get the most critical entries of the software generated. So what are logs used for? Um, I already told you that you might have a software which is kind of broken and you need a log file to find out why it went wrong, why there was an error. But there are also some other fields where it is necessary or important to have a log file. For example, there are regulations and compliance. If you're working for financial services, for example, logging is a very important part. You have to log a lot of um, yeah, actions performed by users, when money was transferred, things like that. And there are very harsh regulations that you need to also keep the log files for a quite long period of time. So regulations and compliance could be a reason why you should do or why you have to do logging. Then another important point are security incidents. I mean, all of you are here to hear things about security in the 
of interconnected things or of the, in the Internet of Things, of small devices um, which are transmitting data. And if you have a security incident, that means that something went wrong there. Um, maybe an attacker entered your network and you want to find out what did he do, what data might he have seen, um, things like that. And for these, uh, to have a look, a closer look at these security incidents, it is very important to have log files so that you can have a log, can have a look at this, um, at what happened. And another point is status monitoring. So, for example, if you have systems, you want to monitor them. You want to know what is happening on these systems. Is there still enough disk space? Um, how is the thing running? Is everything fine? And for that, log files might be helpful as well. Um, you can, for example, um, yeah, just adjust the settings that you get a warning if the disk space is running low so that you, for example, get a warning if disk is used for 80% or something like that. Their log files might be helpful as well. And how can you have a look at them? How can you review logs? Um, a very well-known thing might be SEAMS, so Security Incidents and Event Management Systems. Maybe you don't know the name, but I think all of you know the picture of some people sitting in front of a very large monitor wall consisting maybe of 9 or 10 or 20 or even more monitors and um, having a look if everything is running well in the factory. So this is a very well-known image. And these SEAM systems, they are collecting logs from very different sources, aggregating them together and showing them in graphs, um, yeah, and maybe some very um, important log messages um, so that the reviewer who is sitting in front of such systems can see very fast where are problems or where is everything running in normal way so that he does not have to do something. So visualization is a very important part. We will have a, yeah, a short look at that later on. But also the manual analysis um, is an important part and you don't have to keep that too, too small. Um, I know it's not the most interesting thing to sit in front of a text file with maybe 10,000 or 100,000 or maybe millions of lines and uh, searching for some errors in that file. But it is an important part if you um, want to have a look at a special event, what happened there, maybe also for security incidents. So if you know an attacker attacked your system and if he went in your system and if you want to know very closely what happened, what has he done, then you might have to do a manual analysis of some log files. So where and how should you collect logs? Collecting logs is not the very easy part. It's a very important part and you have to take care about that. You could imagine in an institution or in a yeah, large factory, you have a lot of systems running and all of these systems are creating several logs. So you now need to consider um, it might be a good idea to have a central place to save the logs, to collect all the logs together. So that you have one central system where all the logs are coming together so that you can have a look on them while they are all coming in. And it's also easier to perform a backup there. The live analysis, for example, in SIEM systems, is only possible if you have all the data together on one place. And they are also normally more reliable than the original host. Imagine you have a small device which is creating log files and which is also saving these log files on its yeah, storage, which is attached to it. And uh, then this device crashes. And now you want to have a look at the log file, what happened, why did it crash. But you cannot have a look because the device crashed it might have corrupted its storage and so you cannot have a look anymore at the log files, but they are very important. And this is why it might be a very good idea to save the log files on another system than the system it's generating these entries. Then an RDBS and relational database system, you, I think you know about it. So it's yeah, a database and um, often they are used to 
um, perform analysis on log files. Um, it's more easy to question um, logs which are stored in such databases, for example. Another keyword are, or is syslog. This is the most well-known application to transmit and collect logs. So often syslog is used to collect the log files over different steps and to collect them on one central collector. On the other hand, the Windows event log is um, a propri proprietary version of logging software and is used on Windows systems, so for example, Windows Server or on your Windows notebooks, um, PCs, whatever. A very important um, thing you have to consider is time synchronization. So it is a very difficult problem if you have maybe 20 or 50 or thousands of logs and now you have a security incident and you want to find out what happened. Then you look in the first look, you know, okay, the attacker passed the firewall at 10.20 a.m. And then he went to the second system. And there in the log files at 10.20 a.m., you did not find anything. So you might have a problem with time synchronization. It's important that the different devices are time synchronized so that you can have a look on one log and find something there and this leads you to another log and there you need to find the step when to have a look in these log files of the different system. So synchronization of time is important. And you should also think about the encrypted transmission of log entries. So if you store them at a central point, um, they are transmitting your network. They are flowing through your network and there might be evil persons who are looking at your traffic and if the log messages are yeah, maybe um, having a lot of detailed information in it, it might be very interesting for an attacker to have a look on them. And if you are transmitting them encrypted, he will not be um, able to have a look or a closer look at what is inside the messages. He might just see there is something flowing, but he does not know what is flowing there. So encrypting the transmission might be a thing you would need to consider um, or you want to consider. I will now present you some logging laws. Um, according to a source, I will have linked later on in the presentation, so you can have a look there. This is a book about logging. And I think these laws, and I will also present you some typical logging mistakes I catch from there, because I think this is the most condensed information you might need if you want to start to have a closer look at log files and about things with logging. So the first one is the law of collection. And it's saying, don't collect log data you never plan to use. As I already told you, you might think about a company and the company has maybe 500 employees. Each employee has a workstation in the office. Maybe 200 of them have notebooks because they need to work as well um, on the field. And then you have firewalls, you have servers, and all these systems are generating dozens of logs. And you have to review them. You have to collect them. And so it's getting a mess of data. And so you need to decide, do I really need this log file? Or might I need it later on? And how long do I store it? Yeah, things um, like that have to be considered. It's very difficult, I know, to decide what's really needed because you never know that you need the thing in advance. So there might be an incident where you say, oh, now I need that log, but I did not collect it. So this might happen, but on the other hand, you cannot collect everything. It's just too much normally. And um, keep it if you find reasons um, or yeah, if you find some points where it's interesting um, if you need it in an investigation, for example. So as I said, if there is an attacker and if you want to know what did he do in your network and just imagine that situation and after that you can decide okay I need this log file and I might not that much need this log file so I leave it out because I do not have the possibilities to look at all of this. The second law is the law of retention. So retain log data as long as it might be useful or longer if needed by regulations. 
Again, a very difficult question to answer. How long will you need the log messages you collected? So if you have, for example, log messages of a web server, there are 10,000s, maybe 100,000s of entries coming in every minute, every second. And so log files are getting very huge, very fast. And then you need to know, okay, how long do I need to store these entries? How long might it be interesting to have a such detailed look? Or maybe to have a strategy, for example, just after seven days, uh, you only store error logs afterwards. So error logs are safe for maybe 30 or 45 days, but normal entries which are generated while normal operation and which are not flagged with error, um, they are just um, thrown away after seven days or something like that. So priorita prioritization um, is an important part there. The third law is the law of monitoring. Log all you can as much as possible, but alert only on what you must respond, as few as possible. So you should have a look on your resources, how much can you log, and on the other hand, you need, to, um, you need a lot of time if you want to investigate an alert. So if your system is giving you an alert on some log entries, which are not normal, where something might went wrong, it uh, is a very time-consuming process to investigate that, to have a closer look at these logs, um, to put some people on it that can decide, was there an incident, was it not, what happened there. Um, and so you need to keep these alerts as few as possible. And a good strategy is log everything, um, store some of this, and monitor only what is really needed so that you can have some steps there. And if you get an alert and you want to uh, dive deeper inside what happened there, you have still some more logs where you can look at, um, maybe you have a very uh, defined time window when something happens, so you can have a very detailed and fast look at log files which are still there and which you have not looked at yet. The fourth law is the law of availability. Don't pay to make your logging or monitoring system more available than your business systems. That is also an important part that you do not have to forget. For sure, management will not make you that forget. But it's important to think about that even if logs are crucial for investigations, business systems are still more important. So you need to keep your business running. If your business systems crash, but your log systems are still alive, that will not help you a much much in this situation. I mean, you can have a look in the log files while, why something crashed, but the business systems are a lot more important than the logging systems, and you have to keep that in mind. Fifth law, law of security. Don't pay to protect your log data more than you pay to protect your critical business data. Again, as the fourth law, um, don't pay more to protect your log files than the actual business data, which is normally a lot more important. Um, yeah, it's just the same as with the availability. Um, encryption is out there according to the source still few. Sometimes, um, yeah, companies are using hashing algorithms to, um, yeah, get to make sure the integrity of the log files is still fine. And um, what you should consider is a very stringent um, access control so that you log, again, that you log the entries, who accessed which log files and when, and that you have also a very stringent um, access control system that only few people can have access to it and that it's kind of limited and that you have a very tight control about that. The sixth law is the law of constant changes. Log sources, log types, and log messages change, especially nowadays, because you have a lot of new technology coming in the market. Um, also, with the Internet of Things, you have so many new devices coming there every month, every year, um, in your new company. And with these new devices, the logs also change uh, quite frequently. There are new log messages, 
And um, yeah, to work with these log messages, um, it's important to have a closer look at them. And so you need to keep this process running. Um, which logs do you have to consider? Um, how can you look at them? When do you need to raise an alert? Things like that are important. So now just some logging mistakes. The very first is not logging at all. So if you have no logs enabled and you not even know about it, that you did not enable something, a lot of software is coming with the availability to log, but it's just deactivated in the stock. And um, if you have no logs at all, it's kind of a bad situation because you will realize it if you have an incident, for example, and you want to have a closer look at the files, um, at the log files, and then you n realize, oh, I don't have any logs. That is a very bad situation, so you should really think about what to log. As I said, just um, consider the rules before, then you are already um, yeah, on a quite good way. Let's say it that way. Uh, not looking at the log data is the second mistake. Log data is important and you have to look at it to find incidents, to find things that went wrong, to find problems in your systems. Um, and it's important to review them. Uh, you need trained personnel for that, but again, it's important. And the personnel should also know how to react if they find something uh, in the log files, which is not normal, where they feel like it's bad or where they know oh, that was an attacker or something, they have to know how to act um, for getting the situation back on a good way. And for all that, you should also prioritize the logs um, which are reviewed. So the reviewers should have a priority list and which logs are the most important ones and if they maybe have some time left, they can have a look at logs with a lower priority. Storing logs for too short is the third mistake. And this is especially important for insider attacks, for example, because they are often just discovered some months afterwards. So the people are maybe getting fired and still working uh, some weeks in the company and after six or seven months you realize something is not there anymore and you want to find out what happened but you cannot as it was too late in the past and you have no logs left from there. But as well, storing logs for too long might be a mistake you can do because it might have privacy issues. It is very costly if you have a very good logging strategy you might have terabytes, maybe even more of logging data um, you have to store. And so it's also getting costly. And you need to decide per device and network um, how long you really want to store these log files and also where you want to store these log files. Because you can store them on online systems, like already said in SIEM systems, for example. But you can also store them offline, maybe on a tape, as the tape is still a very cheap way to store a lot of data, but it's quite slow if you want to have a look at it. So it takes a lot of time, you have to take the right tape, you have to enter it in the system, then you have to find the place on the tape where data is stored, you have to load it back on an online system. So you see these steps are taking or consuming a lot of time. And um, so it's important to decide do I need these logs often? Do I work with them a lot? Or are they maybe already so old that I can put them on a um, yeah, storage system which is very cheap and which takes a lot of time if I want to have a look on it. But still, I'm sure I have these logs in the backlog. I have these logs in the backlog, but um, I do not look at them maybe daily or weekly. So it's okay if it takes some time to have a look on them. Um, the fifth one, prioritize before logging. So the decision of what is important is very hard to do beforehand. And not everything will have to be inspected by humans, um, but it can be consulted. So you have to have a look on these log files 
Might they be processed very well with um, yeah, automated systems? Or do I really need special personnel who is looking at these log files? Ignoring application logs is the sixth mistake mentioned here. So only looking at the parameter or the internal network logs is already a good thing as you are looking at logs. But it's on the other hand also a bad thing because application logs might give you a lot more detailed information about what happened there than only network logs where you can see some network data. Uh, in nowadays, a lot of data in the network is encrypted and so you will only see something is happening there between two parties. You know the addresses of the two parties, but not anymore. You don't know what is transmitted. If you have the application log, you might have a good chance to know what the participants were talking about. And the seventh mistake, only looking for bad entries. This is also not a good idea. Um, the decision of good and bad is very, very hard um, to do. And filtering leaves out a lot of entries. So filtering is on the one hand important as you cannot um, yeah, treat every log entry manually. But on the other hand, if you only look for bad things, you might not see entries in the log files um, where bad things are hiding, so where new bad things are inside. If you have a look at these log entries, you might see, oh, this is something I don't want. But if you have a system which is filtering on known bad things, it might not raise an alert on these entries. Now I'll give you um, yeah, a more detailed impression about KNX. You might have got this already in the talk with Thomas, but um, I will just revise some short things so that we all know the same things and um, yeah, that we have the basis on the things we want to work on. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the logical structure of a KNX network. So you have a backbone line, which is connected via backbone couplers, the devices 100 and 200 with the BC. Um, they are connecting the main lines, so you, might, you might have up to 15 or 16 main lines in a network and the backbone couplers are connecting them to the backbone line. On the main line, you again have some line couplers. They are actually the same device as backbone couplers and uh, they are connecting the different lines with the main lines. And on the lines, you have the devices um, so, for example, 111, 112, and you already see in the structure on the bottom right, there's also a picture um, visualizing that you have physical addresses of devices. They are separated with dots in between. And the first 4-bit part is the area part. The middle 4-bit part is the line part. And the last part is 8-bit long. And this is the actual device address. So if you know the device with address uh, 247 has an error or is not working anymore or not responding. You know the device is located in the second area in the fourth line and it's device 7 in that line. So that if you have a very well documented system, you know where the system or where this device is located in your building and you can just go there and uh, exchange it, for example. Um, and then you have group addresses. You can have uh, two-level, three-level, or one-level group addresses. Group addresses are also always 16-bit long. If you have a two-level structure, for example, as we will have that later on, you have a five-bit main part and an 11-bit subgroup part or yeah, group address part. Um, as already said, couplers are connecting different parts of the networks. They are always coming in a tree-shaped structure, so they are kind of very simple networks. And each line is uh, representing a broadcast domain, meaning as you have a bus system here, and that is typical for bus systems, that each device on this section of the network can listen to all the traffic of the devices on that line um, who are talking to others. So, if one device, device A, is communicating with the device C, device B can listen to all the traffic they are exchanging. And this is typical for a bus system. And on each line, 
you will uh, be able to listen to all the traffic which is passing there. The line couplers and the backbone couplers have the availability to filter traffic, so they can filter out some telegrams which are not necessary for that part of the segment so that you cannot hear them anymore in the later on sections. That is what a telegram looks like or what data is inside telegrams. Don't be shocked too much, it's uh, not that much as it is looking here. So on the left hand side you have the layout of a standard telegram which is maybe appearing in 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, you have 22 bytes. Byte 1 is a control field which you can see in a more detailed view on the right hand side. So there is a frame type. We have a standard telegram here so the frame type bit would be set to, uh, to 1 as it's a standard. Then you have some fixed bits. You have a repeat flag. Um, that is said if the telegram is uh, repeated, maybe one device did not receive it correctly and so the transmission has to be repeated again. Um, you have a priority in it. Um, then there are two addresses, the source address, where the telegram is coming from and the destination address, where it's going to. You have the destination address flag. That is uh, necessary to decide if the destination address is a group address or a physical address. So is the telegram going to only one special device or to a group of devices? Then you have a hop count that is like the time to live in the IP world. So it's like how many hops did this telegram already made? How many line couplers or backbone couplers has it passed? Then you have the payload length, the payload actually, and some parity fields and normally KNX is using even parity. And the whole system is communicating via communication objects. And a communication object is a memory area that is used for data exchange with other applications or devices by the application software of a KNX device in combination with the communication software. Um, yeah, don't be scared. It's not that difficult. We will have a look at the practical example I will show you in some minutes. And then you will understand easily what communication objects are and how the whole thing works. So, but before we'll have a bit more detailed look at the communication project or process, sorry. Um, each device has several communication objects and the transmission of values is triggered by flags which are set for these communication objects. Um, they can only be connected if they have the same data point type. So the data point type is giving the description of the encoded data. For example, you have like a one bit value. So one bit is like on off or something like that. And if you have a light switch and the light bulb, um, yeah, just say the light bulb for the lamp or for the thing which is actually switching the light bulb. Um, and both of them should be connected so that you push, this, uh, push the button, the light should switch on. And so you need a one bit value with on or off which is transmitted. And both of these devices will have communication objects, um, different ones. We will also come to that later. You will see it. And you can only connect the communication objects of these different devices if they have the same um, data point type. So this is a very important thing. But the software you are programming the devices with, the ETS software, is helping you with that because it says if the data point types are incompatible, for example. And the thing behind that is that the data point type is not transmitted. So this is the thing why you only can connect uh, communication objects with the same data point type because there's just some data transmitted and the device receiving this data uh, does not know what kind of data is it, how is it uh, encoded and all this is regulated in the data point type description and um, this is also why you can only connect communication objects which are of the same data point type. And the communication objects are connected to group addresses via the ETS software. 
So they are not directly linked together. Not device A is not directly speaking to device B. Direct A, uh, device A is only speaking to a group address and it does not know if there are 50, 100, thousands or only one device behind that group address um, which are listening to the traffic coming to this address. Um, as I already said, there are flags for the communication objects and um, yeah, you have different flags, for example, the transmit flag and uh, if that flag is set, the value behind this communication object is changed at the sensor, then a telegram is sent. So you have, for example, um, the push button, which you need to enable the light, and it has a storage area in its device where the value of the push button is stored. So it's zero. Let's just say it's zero now. And then I push the button and the value changes to one. And the transmit flag of this communication object is uh, set. So the value in the storage did change from zero to one. And this is why a communication process is started and the push button is transmitting the new value, which is one, to the um, group address it is connected to. So here our very basic example. You have a light switch and a light bulb or a lamp or a switching actuator um, and the light switch has address 111. It has two communication objects, um, the switch and an LED, which is, yeah, which you can use to maybe set the LED to one if the light is on or set the LED to one if the light is off so that you find the switch easier. And in this basic setup, the uh, communication object zero of the switch with the switching functionality is connected to group address 11 and from the light actuator it has only one communication object that is a switching thing and it's also connected to group address 11. Um, in the switch you can see the flags C and T are set so the T, uh, the C is the communication flag and this is uh, what this means normally connected to the bus and um, if not transmitted are acknowledged but not written. And the T is uh, standing for the transmit flag as I explained in before, if the value is changing, it's automatically transmitted. For the light bulb, you have uh, C and W set. C, again, the communication flag and W is the write flag. Um, and this means the object value can be manipulated via the bus. So if the light switch is pressed, a telegram is sent via the bus and it's yeah, transmitted to all the devices which are member of group address 11 and the light bulb is receiving the telegram coming in on address 11 and it knows communication object zero um, of it is connected to this address and so a new value is coming in the current value is zero, the new value coming in is one, and the flag W means that it, the value stored in the uh, storage part of the light bulb, for example, which is zero right now, might be transmitted or might be changed by a transmitted telegram. So value one is coming in and then it can be changed. So it is allowed to be changed via the network. Yeah, before we come to the practical, or practical thing about how to connect the light switch and the light um, or lamp together uh, via the ETS software, we'll have a short excourse on analyzing KNX log data. Um, we'll now have a look on data from a log file from the 10th of July 2016 to the 28th of September 2016 here from the Konrad Zuse House at the University of Rostock. Size of the data set is about 1.7 million observations and the log data are just all the fields mm, which are uh, yeah, transmitted in the telegrams. Um, there are some fields like attack type ID or sensor address, um, which are always the same. For example, attack type ID or is manipul manipulated is always set to zero. So there is no attack. Um, this is a log file which is also available online so that everyone can have a look at it 
and there are some uh, yeah, versions of this log file where uh, manipulations have been inserted so that you can train, for example, IDS systems or something. But here we are looking at the raw log data which was really logged by the system. So to visualize that a bit, you can here have a look at the amount of telegrams per day. And you might have expected to see maybe a weekly cycle or something like that, but no, you cannot. You can maybe hardly, in the second part in September, you might see something like a weekly cycle. Um, you can see end of August, there are just a lot of telegrams on two days. I don't know why. Um, it's just not very clear. So we have to clear that out. We have to filter the data a bit to get a more detailed view. And uh, if we have a look on the y-axis, we have here about yeah, 20,000 telegrams per day. Um, now we can see the amount of telegrams per day. And we are here looking at fan coil devices and the weather station. Actually, we are only looking at the part of the network here in the Konrad Sousa house. Um, but that is no problem. There are, I don't know, about 100 devices or something like that inside. And there is the weather station, which is mounted on the rooftop. And it is very regularly transmitting telegrams. And there are fan coil devices. They are installed in mostly the inside rooms to regulate the room temperature. And I don't know why exactly, but they are, yeah, let's say very verbose. They are talking a lot. Um, if we see here, we have maybe about yeah, 17,000 to 20,000 telegrams per day. And if we switch back, we had also about 20,000 telegrams per day in the whole data set. And now we are only looking at two groups of devices, two groups. Um, and they are nearly um, yeah, generating all the log data which we found. So what is if we look at the opposite? not at fan coil devices and not at the weather station. Um, so for example, light switches, motion detection sensors, things like that. Then we can see a very clear weekly cycle. And we also see that we do not have that many telegrams. So now we have about 2000, yeah, on the weekends about 500 or 700 telegrams per day. So it's getting a lot fewer data and the data is getting a lot more clear. So now here we can see very well the weekly cycle, um, which is representing the usage of the building as it, uh, as it is used for students, um, which are normally here during the week. So same thing if we look at the amount of telegrams per hour. Here we see the telegrams per hour of the day. Um, yeah, there is a lot of telegrams in the morning hours, but it's a very yeah, not so steep thing. I would have expected a lot more during the workday and a lot fewer in the night. Again, we look at the fan coil devices in the weather station. Yeah, it's about same like as before. And also the y-axis is also about, yeah, here we have 70,000 to 80,000 telegrams per hour. Now it's uh, 60 to 70,000. So it's nearly all the data in the log. But if you look at the opposite thing, there we can see our daily cycle. Um, people are coming in from 5 in the morning and they are leaving yeah, from 17 to 18 o'clock. Um, afterwards, they're getting a lot fewer and fewer. Maybe some students are also working during nighttime, um, but they are few. And here we have different device classes. We have the weather station, we have switches, motion sensors, fan coil devices, displays, which are installed in the labs or in the offices for um, some switches um, showing temperature information, things like that. And we have some actuators, actually lamps, for example, or lights. And uh, here we can see the fan coil devices are having the most big part of the telegrams or they are generating the most telegrams. Um, and we have to pay attention to the scale of the x-axis because it's a logarithmic scale. And that again shows how, um, how much data really these fan coil devices are generating and how few on the opposite side are generated via, via switches or displays or actuators. 
Um, yeah, after that, we might have got a short impression um, how KNX logs might look like. And now we want to have a short look in how to program such, soft, uh, such devices, such uh, field bus devices, such KNX devices, and how we can combine them in the ETS software to work together. Yeah, we will now use KNX virtual, which is just a virtual yeah, programmed uh, network, a KNX network where you might have, or where you can connect some devices together um, on your notebook where you can see the output of the devices and the communication is done via a virtual IP gateway which is emulated by this software. So here in the settings you see the IP address. We are now opening an IP gateway on localhost and the interface, interface address we can see here. The things here we do not need to consider too much. We just press OK and we're good to go. Now we go to the ETS5 software which you can download for free from the website but in the free version you can only connect, it, connect a few devices together. But this is enough for us. We now start with a new project. We call it just um, yeah, lighting project. Uh, there we go, backbone is IP. We could use here twisted pair, but this is fine. Um, we create already line 1.1 one, one with twisted pair. We also have power line, um, radio frequency or IP uh, as possible options. And there we have the group address style free, which is one layered, um, two level or three level. We use a two level structure for group addresses. This is enough. We only need one group address here. So we are good with the two level. Then we open the project. And this is the basic view we get at the beginning. Um, we have different working areas. We are now in the building um, area. We have group addresses, topology, project root, devices, reports, catalogs, diagnostics. So we have a lot of different functionality which is grouped in different yeah, views together. We just start with the building view and at the first we here have our lighting project. There's nothing more inside. So we now add a building. We just call it building 01. Um, and press OK. And now in the lighting project we have building 01. The button you see up here changed from add building to add floors. We now need a floor. Let's just call it ground floor. And there we go. Now we have a ground floor, but we do not have any rooms yet. And now we need to add a room. And we do that by pressing add rooms and we just call it entrance. We can also set the usage level here. Um, what is the room used for? Just yeah, call it corridor, press OK. And this is nothing you need to specify, but it's helpful if you specify that very accordingly to a, your real building which you are connecting. I mean, now here we have a virtual thing, but if you have a real building or maybe several buildings, it's very helpful to have a good structure here so that you can find devices easily in your project. And now if we click on our room, um, we are able to add devices. If we click on that, um, yeah, it's just loading the second viewport, which is the catalog. And there we see already some different manufacturers of KNX devices. They all offer a database file, which you can import in the ETS. And inside these database files, the different products they are selling are or can be found and um, then afterwards you can uh, program then you see here for example uh, diagnosis and protection module um, we have here from ABB for example presence detectors there's no image uh, couplers things like that IP routers um, but here we use the manufacturer um, called KNX I think the Canix Association and um, here we can choose our products which we use um, in our Canix virtual software. And we want to use the 
push button, device four. Um, we just add that to our room. So it's now adding it. And now we here have it in our room entrance with address 111. Um, yeah, we can here see some settings. Um, nothing of importance. Let us just add the second device we need, the switching actuator, D7. This is, for example, a light where you can attach a light bulb to. So now we have the two devices here. We can close the catalog view. We don't need that anymore. And we start with the switching actuator. Actually, we can program the whole thing, the whole devices. We can set all the settings inside the software uh, wherever we are. And in a second step, we have to program the devices one by one. Uh, we have to assign them the um, yeah, physical addresses. And then we have to load the yeah, settings we were entering in the software here to the devices. Um, we will do that later on, but in before we can all connect together, um, set all the things up, and afterwards upload it to the actual devices. Um, what we see here now is the devices tab. Um, we can also go to the topology view um, if we want to. We have here one area, one line, and two devices in this line. Um, and here we see already group objects of these devices, um, channels, parameters. Um, let's go back to the building view. So. so here we see the devices. And if we click on one device, for example, the switching actuator, first of all, we can give it a name here. Uh, switch um, entrance. The individual address, we could change it here if you want to. We can enter a description. Uh, we can set a status like uh, finished design, tested, accepted, locked, whatever. We just leave it on unknown. It's fine for us. We can enter some comments here, installation hits, uh, hints, sorry. And we have some information here, how much current it is consuming. Um, yeah, things like that. So the important part for us are the group objects, which are here, channel 1 to channel 8. We can also see them here in the channels. We could rename the channel. Let's say um, lamps entrance. And we have parameters here. Room temperature. We can enable room temperature control. We don't need that now. We have channel 1 here, config channel 1. Switching no feedback, we could change that. Um, but for us, it's fine if we have switching no feedback. If we set, for example, dimming, we will get different communication objects. I can show that to you for channel two. We set that to dimming 8-bit feedback. Channel three, we can set to uh, blinds no feedback. And if we look at the group objects, and before we had only channel one to eight switching on off. Now we have channel one switching on off. We want to use that for our lamp or our light. Then we have channel two, uh, dimming on off, dimming control, feedback of the dimming. Channel three, we have move, step, stop. So we see we are generating different communication objects by using different options in the parameters. So now we have here our switching actuator. We call that light entrance. And there also we have different channels. Here, for example, channel one, we also call that light entrance. And in the parameters, we can um, configure an alarm, um, a timeout, we don't need that, we don't need any feedback. It's fine for us like it is right now. So now we have our two devices here and we have set them up as we want them. But if we would program the devices right now, um, we would not have any interconnecting um, thing between them. The interconnecting thing here in this um, special uh, project are group addresses. So we need to change to the group address view and 
at a main group, we call that lighting. Um, yeah, count one is fine, filled up, fill up, so it's just starting with um, main group zero, and we can now add a group address light entrance. So it's using the first free address. So in the address zero one, we have the light entrance, and there are no objects inside right now. Um, we can now open a second workplace with the building. We know that from before. And now here we have our building with the entrance, and there we have our devices. If we click on the switch or the switching of the entrance, we have channel one switch on off, and we just um, yeah, pull it via drag and drop in the group address zero one. So now it's linking the device or channel one of this device to group address zero one. Uh, you can also see it down here, description, light entrance, uh, group address zero one. And then we have the actual lamp or lighting system which is mounted there. And there we have also channel one. We pull it up here, it's linked. And now we have here switched. We also see the flags as we have seen in the slides in before. And um, they are just perfectly matching together. If we, for example, um, pull the dimming control up here, it says validation failed. Um, the group address cannot be linked to the group address um, 12, channel two, dimming, dimming control, object size differs. So this means um, the ETS software is giving us the hint here that these communication objects cannot work together. But we also don't want it. So now we are fine, we're good to go. We have a group address, there are two things connected. Um, we have the two devices, the switch and the light. And now we need to program our devices. So for that, you might have seen already here is the download button. We can say download all. So this will mean download the uh, physical address of the device and the um, yeah, software which we um, were entering the settings with the group addresses and things like that. For um, programming a physical address, you will always have to press a um, programming button, a physical button on the device itself so that the device is knowing Ah, I am the one which is getting the address um, programmed by the software right now. We need everything, so we just click on download all. And then we can see here on the right hand side, uh, switch entrance, download. Please press programming button. We'll do that. We just change our switch here to the devices. And we know device four is our programming button. We click on the um, yeah, programming button. <laughs> Uh, this is just a small field here. Um, for a device, normally you have a real physical button where you have to press. And now we see it's downloading the content to the device. Here the um, button is already, the light is already off. It was finished, everything fine. Now we have to program the switching actuator. We also say download all and we will need to press the programming button. This is device D7. So we press the programming button here as well. Wait a short moment for downloading the data needed. So the application software for the device itself. And then we can go back to the base view. Here we have our switching actuator and we have our lamps. And here we have zero and one. And if you press one on the switching actuator, the light will go on and for zero it goes off. So we are fine with that. But what else can ETS do for us? If you have, for example, an existing KNX install installation and if you want to have a closer look at this installation, you can just close these here, click on the diagnostics button. button. Um, there is a bus monitor, for example. We can start that monitor. We are connected, we see down here, localhost on port. 3671, this is the typical KNX port for IP gateways. And now we are connected and we are logging. And we can pull that a bit down. And if we press here one and zero, 
we see here priority low from switch 111, switch entrance, destination address 01, light entrance. Um, we can see here, uh, hop count things, what was the type of the telegram group value right, data point type, switching, uh, info, it was the on, so 01. And we can see here all the data which was sent. And uh, we also can see the bus load here, message count, things like that. And if we have the program or the project file still open, um, the software also knows uh, the device 111 is a switching actuator and the device 112 is the light in the entrance area and so we get these uh, speaking names here. Otherwise, we would not have them here, but we can also use the diagnostic mode um, if we do not have the according project file. So now you have seen um, yeah, in a short, very, very tiny project um, how to connect a light switch with an actual lamp via KNX, how you have to program that. And it's working like that for all the other devices which are out there, and there are a lot. Um, what have we done? We have connected yeah, the light switch with the lamp via one or via two communication objects via one group address. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to hear them. I'm happy to answer them if possible. Uh, thank you for your attention so far. Um, you can also see my contact details here. So if you have a question later on, just contact me. That's fine. And here's the literature. Um, so the logging and log management book, I can really recommend it to you. And for starting the discussion part, um, I'm already curious about your questions and your thoughts about logging um, forensics in log files, so how to handle log files. Um, and to enter the discussion part, I have some questions prepared. Um, so number one, are you logging and what are you logging? Number two, what is necessary to prevent attacks or decrease the risk of attacks? Number three, what forensic analysis might be possible with the data gained? Uh, interesting one. Number four, is logging problem problematic according to data privacy? So I would like to hear your thoughts about the questions, but also about your questions that you have. Um, I want to have a fruitful discussion with all of you so that we can just exchange ideas, uh, maybe getting some new ideas on what to pay attention to. And um, I'm looking very forward to that. See you in a minute.